All right, we're back and we're going to talk about work in adulthood because let's be honest, much of adulthood is devoted to work. Usually by the age of 25, people are starting to settle into stable careers. Um, not a guarantee. A lot of us are still looking and, and striving during that time, but we, you know, in adulthood, most of us will experience stable careers. Um, so we're starting to settle down um, by midlife you start to find that you start reaching positions of powers, power. You get to make decisions. You get to, um, you know, be a supervisor over other people. Um, in midlife, our experience and our expertise is going to be valued in the company or the organization where we work uh, because the company and organization is probably always hiring younger people who need to be trained and taught the culture of the company and those kinds of things. So experience and expertise of, of midlife employees usually is valued. Uh, most leaders in most fields are in what we consider the middle work years. That would be 35 to 65. You know, there are certain exceptions. Certain tech industries have younger um, leaders and things like that. But on and, and some fields like uh, medicine or politics might have older people on average. But on average in most, most um, industries, we're looking at leaders being between 35 and 65. It's something that you have to sort of work towards. Now there are two major categories of stable workers and we've got the workaholics on the left and we've got the mellowed workers on the right. Um, the workaholics, you probably know what the word already means, but um, there's two kinds of workaholics. There are the type who are driven by success. They either are trying to earn enough money or they're trying to achieve a certain level of status and they feel like if they put the work in, they'll ultimately be recognized. Um, it's also the kind of workaholic where maybe they've got responsibility or um, they're on their way to responsibility and they're afraid that if they give up anything, if they take time off, if they leave on time, those kinds of things, that they'll sort of lose some of their status or authority. Um, so there's sort of the people who are climbing the ladder and then there are the people who are sort of protecting their status that they already have achieved. Then there are the mellowed workers who are satisfied with their level of achievement, that feel like you know, even if I'm not where I ultimately want to be, I'm not going to kill myself trying to get there. I'm going to try and have a balance between work and life. And it's, you know, that's a real challenge to have a balance between work and life. And, you know, a lot of companies now are recognizing that employees want that and they're trying to encourage their employees to have a work-life balance. But it's hard as an employee not to kind of feel a little bit threatened if you take a work-life balance and you feel like your, your competitor is not you might feel pushed back into that competitive, you know, working more than you really want to or that you're really enjoying. Um, so there's kind of two ways that people in stable careers kind of go, either workaholism or kind of mellowed and, and taking it um, with a work-life balance attitude. Now there are work and gender issues that I wanted to touch on. Um, it used to be that, you know, if you were male, you were funneled through into these kinds of jobs. And if you're a female, you were funneled into those kinds of jobs. Um, I'm offline right now, so I can't show you this link, but um, it's linked in the, in the classroom um, to an, an in, informational um, document that shows you that, you know, women are going in, more women are going into traditionally male careers, more male men are going into traditionally female careers. It's still pretty much the case, though, that um, we have some disparity in the male-female balance in jobs that are in the top panel, we're seeing the highest paying occupations, and then in the bottom panel, we're seeing the lowest paying occupations. And uh, you'll notice that the highest paying occupations are ones that require either a lot of spatial and mathematical skills and or danger and or exposure to, to toxins. <laughs> you'll notice those are the high pay, highest paying careers. Um, and then you'll notice that the lower paying careers are oftentimes service careers, careers where you're um, filling a spot that um, might be being, might normally be, um, might typically be covered by somebody who would do it in the home for free, but they've gone out of the home to, to earn money. And so now they need to pay somebody to do their work. And so you'll notice those kinds of careers being in the lowest paying categories. Um, the definitely lower skilled um, jobs are in the lowest paying categories. So we're still seeing a lot of gender disparity in which sex goes into which um, career more often. Um, here we have a rising share of stay at home mothers occurring in the um, 2000s. 
you know, there had been just this really strong decline from 1967 down to 1997. And then we see a slow increase in the number of um, moms staying home with their kids. So that's a change in um, recent years. Um, here's another infographic that shows us stay at home and working mothers who, and um, this is only for moms who have children younger than the age of 18. So uh, among the stay at home moms, 49% of them are non-white, 40% um, of them are uh, working, 40% are non-white and working. Of the foreign born, 33% are staying home, 20% um, are working. And of those who have high school diploma or less, 49% are staying at home, 30% are working. And of those who are living in poverty, 34% are at, staying at home and 12% are working. Um, so how about this? Um, employment rates for men and women have changed over time. It used to be that 92% of men were in the workforce, now 76% are. It used to be that 53% of women were in the workforce and now 67% are. So as women are entering the workforce, it's allowing some men to leave the workforce. So kind of um, a change of, of patterns. Oops. And then my final infographic from the same Pew Research Center. Um, we have stay-at-home and working mothers. Uh, so again, these are people who have, um, women who have children under the age of 18. 53% of them are working in 1970, and 40% um, were married with a working husband. And 70, in 2012, 20% were staying at home and married with a working husband, as opposed to 71% were working. So we've had a change in demographics as far as working moms in the workforce over time. Um, now we have a different source that's showing the medium U.S. income by age and sex in 2015. And so you can see in the teen years, um, you know, 16 to 24, it's, there isn't much gender difference in earnings. It's, uh, males are earning a little bit more. By, 24, by 25 to 34, uh, the pay gap is still um, pretty close. But as we get above age 35, the pay gap starts to really change. And a lot of that has to do with um, childbearing and rearing demands, uh, taking breaks in the work history, things like that that can then you miss out on promotions and other kinds of things, might have to find a new kind of job, might need some new training before you can go back. And so it sort of puts women um, at a lower income in the older years. Now of course these are um, cross-sectional data. And so one of the things we will be interested to see is if these 25 to 34 year olds who in you know, 2015 were uh, not perfect, but closer together. If by the time they are 55 to 64, if we'll see less of a gap, that'll be the interesting longitudinal data that we'll be following with um, young adults who are mostly working at the same rate and um, earning very close to the same income. All right, so that concludes my conversation on work. All right, I will see you guys in chapter 22.